Welcome to Reflections on the Rock at Covenant United Methodist Church in Rochester, New York. I'm Christina Parker. I have here with me Christine Duran. So this is uh, the Chris Show yeah. uh, for Friday, July 21st, 2023. We have with us also Kevin Lieb on piano and Bob Kern, who is uh, doing our tech work tonight. Thank you both. Our opening music tonight is I Want to Walk as a mm. Child of the Light. This is number 206 in our hymnal. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we come before you tonight as your thankful people, thankful that you created us and that you love us, thankful that we have the freedom to come before you openly and proclaim our love for you and your word. Please help us let go of all the pressures of our busy day and quiet our hearts now as we devote this time to reflect on your word. We desire this so that we may grow more mature in our relationships with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's scripture is Romans 8, 12 through 25, and it's from the J.B. Phillips translation, our favorite from teenhood, yes. our teen years. Mm -hmm. It's the first script, um, translation that helped me make sense. He used words I understood. In a, it, and in an order I understood. It does that for me too, and I hope that others will relate to this reading that you're about to do. So, so then, you can see that we owe no duty to our sensual nature or to live life on the level of the instincts. Indeed, that way of living leads to certain spiritual death. But if, on the other hand, you cut the nerve of your instinctive actions by obeying the spirit, you will live. All who follow the leading of God's spirit are God's own children. Nor are you meant to relapse into the old slavish attitude of fear. You have been adopted into the very family circle of God. And you can say with a full heart, Father, my Father, the Spirit himself endorses our inward conviction that we really are the children of God. Think what that means. If we are his children, then we are God's heirs. And all that Christ inherits will belong to us as well. Yes, if we share in his sufferings, we shall certainly share in his glory. In my opinion, whatever we may have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent, magnificent future God has in store for us. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the children of God coming into their own. The world of creation cannot as yet see reality, not because it chooses to be blind, but because in God's purpose it has been so limited, yet it has been given hope. And the hope is that, in the end, the whole of created life will be rescued from the tyranny of change and decay and have its share in that magnificent liberty which we can only belong to the children of God. It is plain to anyone with eyes to see that at the present time, all of life groans in a sort of universal travail. And it is plain, too, that we have 
We who have a foretaste of the Spirit are in a state of painful tension while we wait for that redemption of our bodies. That will mean that we have realized our full adoption in him. We were saved by this hope, and let us remember that hope always means waiting for something that we do not yet see. For who hopes for what they can already see? But if we hope for something we cannot see, then we must settle down to wait for it in patience. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for, the, for giving me the opportunity to read the scripture. Yes, yes, and you did it beautifully. Well, we see that our scripture for tonight starts with, so then, or in, in some translations, therefore, mm -hmm. and so on. If we've learned anything at all from our dear friend Margaret Scott, no, oh, yes, it's that when a passage is clearly a continuation, we need to go back and look at what came before. In this case, we're looking at a small part of a long letter from the Apostle Paul to the Christians at Rome. During last Friday's reflection for July 14th, Bob Curtin spoke on the section that immediately precedes the one we heard just now. I think Bob did an excellent job laying the foundation for what we'll say tonight. I encourage you to go back and listen to Bob's reflection if you haven't already. Or if you're feeling ambitious, read the entire book of Romans <laughs> and you'll gain a pretty thorough grounding of Christian doctrine as Paul understood it. To recap briefly what Bob said last week, when we, can, when we commit ourselves to live as Christians, we change the way we make decisions. Mm -hmm. Before, we went with what our sinful nature, also known as the flesh, wanted to do. In the Phillips translation we're using tonight, the flesh or sinful nature is expressed as sensual nature or instinct. It's basically the propensity toward selfishness that we're all born with. But as Christians, we consciously align our minds with the Holy Spirit of God that now lives within us. We strengthen that connection through exposure to the church and other positive influences. By such means, we become free of control by mm. our sinful nature. We develop a moral compass and we surrender ourselves to control by the Spirit instead. We still have a choice in everything because we still have free will. But we are strengthened to make better choices. So, Bob, I hope that right. I hope that's a, a fair reflection of what you said <laughs> last week. <laughs> Moving on to tonight's reading, verse 12 and 13 conclude, we owe no duty to our sensu sensual nature or to live life on the level of the instincts. Indeed, that way of living leads to certain spiritual death. Paul adds that living according to the spirit leads to life. Now, those two verses are sort of a bridge between last week's reading and this week's reading. But now we get into some additional ideas laid on top of that foundation. Verse 14 builds on the foundation by telling us that those who follow Christ's spirit are actually adopted as children of God. I have a special connection to this concept because my dad was adopted when he was ah. a baby. His birth parents were coerced into giving him up. This was back in 1926. Mm -hmm. They lived up near Toronto in Canada and uh, uh, they, were, they eloped and got married about a week or two before my dad was born. Mm. And this being 1926, that was not socially acceptable at all, especially to the groom's family. They were told that if they wanted to come back home, they would do it without the baby. Oh dear. And that's what they did. They gave him up to a, uh, for adoption with an older couple who were more of an age to be his grandparents who lived near Buffalo. Wow. We still don't know all the details. Uh, but I didn't know any of this until three years ago when I discovered those, oh. that birth family and ancestry. I've gotten to know them 
And last year I attended a family reunion and found wow. that they were wonderful, wonderful people. I love them. And uh, it's been very rewarding. Uh, but there's no doubt that Dad gained some significant privileges and advantages in becoming a member of his adoptive family. He was brought up with very solid values, a respected place in their community, and a life of material security. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he became an heir, inheriting some of the assets that belonged to the family. This is what Paul says of us as Christians, that we will become co-heirs with Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What exactly will be that legacy? Surely eternal life heaven, yes, and the chance to participate in that ideal life described in the book of Revelation. But eternal life is not just for the future. Our eternal lives have already begun. We have already have access to some of our inheritance, especially, I think, the freedom we have in Christ, the freedom from the fear and tyranny found under some other religious traditions for example. Paul is quick to add in verse 17 that belonging to the family of God can also bring suffering. If your adoptive family goes through tough times, so do you. Paul knew this firsthand. His Christian experience included such things as beatings, jail mm, time, right, right. shipwrecks, along with a lot of grueling travel and hard work and eventually it would end in his execution. And I think Paul had a sense of that. In verse 18, he writes, whatever we may have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has in store for us. Now for him, that was saying something. <laughs> yeah. Finally, he cautions the Romans not to be impatient as they wait for this wonderful future. To me, that seems a bit foreign. Uh, That's not something we have to be cautioned about today. Mm -hmm. But for the first century Christians who were much less comfortable than many of us are, they were expecting Jesus to come back any day and certainly within their lifetimes. They had hope and we have hope, but their hope seems to have been a much more urgent thing. Mm -hmm. yes. Paul describes creation as groaning like a woman in labor. <laughs> I think not many of us consider our heavenly future a matter of great urgency. Some of us may be enjoying this present life a little bit too much, and I include myself in that number. Mm. On the other hand, I don't doubt that we're in some stage of the end times as described in Revelations. And the world as a whole is suffering. Yes. Wars, famines, climate disturbances, pandemics, and widespread crises of all kinds leave little doubt of it. Though we cannot see our utopian future when Christ will come again, it is the precious hope that keeps us going when others might despair. Ah, beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Bob, for laying a firm foundation for us to move on to understanding this part of Romans. Yes. Let us center our hearts and our minds in a spirit of prayer. Precious God, when everything seems to be in darkness, we come to you in hope for light. When our families are in pain and suffering, we come to you in hope for strength and restoration. When our neighborhoods ache with poverty and violence, we come to you in hope for resolution. 
when our nation is at war with itself, we come to you in hope for peace. And when we are at a loss, we come to you for hope. And when we are at a loss for words, we are comforted in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For announcements tonight, we'd like to tell you that uh, Sunday's text will be Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, 36 to 43. So uh, please join us either in person at the church or online for that. We'll be celebrating our national night out on August 1st. Uh, and that is, uh, as we heard Wednesday, a crime prevention initiative that, we, that was created 40 years ago and that we celebrate by having uh, an, an outdoor supper free of charge on the front lawn of the church. We're going to be having uh, pizza served by Peels on Wheels and we're going to have uh, special guest speakers, Honorable Van White, the city court judge, and Charlene Leistman, executive director of Monroe County Pretrial Services. So, so please join us for that. And um, also August 18th and 19th is our annual new to you sale. On the 18th, which is a Friday, we'll be having uh, the big, big rummage sale in the basement of the church. Uh, we're, we're welcoming donations for that of things that can be sold at the sale. And just a quick caution, we do not use clothing in that sale, but almost everything else besides clothing, whether, whether uh, home furnishings or uh, uh, books or you know uh, dishes, just, just kind of anything else that, that you have that you're no longer using that people in our neighborhood may be able to use. What we do is we sell things at a reasonable price. It's an out, outreach to the community. And the next day, after uh, keeping aside some things for the, the following year, we give away what we have left to people in the neighborhood. So that's a very, very worthwhile event. Please join us for that. We prefer that donations be given to the church during the week before the sale, but we can accept them before that if needed. Our postlude is called, We Are God's People. <laughs> Let us always keep in mind, keep that in mind as we go about our day and evening, and as we sleep peacefully, knowing God is watching over us. May we always remember God's glorious promises, and may we cling to the hope of that wonderful, eternal, future life that we cannot yet see. Hmm. So. Good night. Good night.